This is a part of the biography of Jesus. Those gospels are biographies. And here's what we can learn about Christmas and uh, and overcoming a messy past. And that's what we want to focus on today. Now, Christmas can be complicated. Life is complicated anyway. There are plenty of demands. There's there's a lot of pressure. Plenty of uh, things on your calendar. And then December comes around and just adds to that and you get another layer of those things you you have christmas parties and christmas responsibilities and you have your shopping and you have the stresses that go with uh, all the preparations and then maybe some family tensions along the way in the season so our messy christmas series we began last week is an effort to to demystify the hallmark card kind of uh christmas and to get back to more of a reality kind of Christmas. So this is what it actually feels like and where it touches our lives and where the struggles are. And what I want to remind you of today is that Jesus came. The reason Jesus came was to free us by his grace from the most messy of pasts. Now, Jesus didn't just come for us, but in God's great plan. And in the, what we're going to read today, he illustrated how it works. He showed example after example after example of how God, by his grace, can free us from the past. And we find it, how it was done through Jesus' own family tree. Now, some of you, I know, are very interested in your own genealogy, a lot of Ancestry.com, and you're sending in DNA samples, and you're figuring out where you came from and who you are and all those things. Well, genealogies show up in the Bible multiple times, except usually when they show up in in the Bible, we say, what in the world is that? And what am I supposed to do with it? It's a lot of unrecognizable and impossible to pronounce names. And it leaves us a little bit buffaloed in the, in the scheme of things. So we're going we're gonna to break one of these out with some of the gold, the treasure, to be found in a genealogy. And they all have it. It may take a little extra digging, but we're going to get there today with uh, some quick examples. So this is Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Here's what it says. This is how Matthew chose to begin, for a variety of reasons, begin his gospel. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Verse 2, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac was the father of Jacob, and Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah by Tamar. You might want to note that. Verse 3, and Perez, the father of Hezron, Hezron, the father of Ram, Ram, the father of Aminadab, Aminadab, the father of Nation, Nashon, the father of Salmon, Salmon, the father of Boaz by Rahab, might, might make a note there, and Boaz, the father of Obed by Ruth, make a note of that, Obed, the father of Jesse, Jesse, the father of David the king, then David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah. Let make note of the last part of verse 6. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asaph. Asaph, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Joram. Joram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the father of Ahaz. And Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amos. Amos, the father of Josiah. And Josiah, the father of Jeconiah and his brothers, at the time of the deportation to Babylon. After the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel was the father of Zerubbabel. Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. Abiud, the father of Elakim. Elakim, the father of Azor. Azor, the father of Zadok. Zadok, the father of Achim. Achim, the father of Eliud. Eliud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Matan, Matan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who is called the Christ. I don't get any credit for that. Come on. I made up most of the pronunciations, but I was smooth, and that's the best you can hope for. All right. Now, here's the interesting part. There are a lot of things about this genealogy that stand out, but here's the interesting part for me. In what we just read, from verse 1 to verse 16, there are five women listed. Now, here's the thing about a Jewish genealogy. Women did not get that kind of press in the ancient world, but they are elevated to a high level. This would never have happened anywhere except in God's Word. Certainly for that time, a woman had no legal rights. A woman was considered a second-class citizen at multiple levels of society. Uh, some of you are familiar for uh, 
really religious Jewish man, uh, there was a whole set of them, that they would begin their day with a prayer of thanks to God. And this was the prayer of thanks. Oh God, I thank you that I was not born a Gentile, a slave, or a woman. Amen. You know, if I don't have anything else going for me, at least I don't have those, the, those uh, weights to have to carry around with me. So women listed here are an interesting statement about the nature of God. And it's an interesting set of women too. So I want to break some of that out. And I mentioned uh, a few of these in verse 3. The first one is, is Tamar. Now Tamar is not one. You probably, you've heard of the rest, but maybe not Tamar. Tamar entered the royal bloodline of the Messiah, of Jesus, Here's how she did it. She disguised herself as a prostitute, seduced her father-in-law, and had a baby by him. That's how she gets into this flow of the genealogy of Jesus. Now, that's not a real happy story, is it? There are a whole lot of problems with that. Now, Judah, son of Jacob, patriarch of one of the 12 tribes of Israel, he, he did some good things. He did a whole lot of bad things. And he mistreated her. He disgraced her. He created a lot of problems for her. And she found a way to solve this problem. But ultimately, he had denied her justice. And the whole story wrapped around her is a pretty ugly affair. Yet, she shows up in this line. The second one's in verse 5, and that's Rahab. Uh, you find her in Joshua. Joshua chapter, what is chapter 2, chapter 5, her name shows up. And here's the deal with Rahab. When she's described, it says, now there was a prostitute, there was a harlot in Jericho by the name of Rahab. Uh, that's, not, uh, that's not something to put a lot of pride in either. What happened is Joshua, he sends in a couple spies into the promised land. They're about to come across. The people in Jericho, they know there's this huge horde of people on the other side of the, other side of the Jordan River, and they're coming their way, and they're on the lookout, and they hear there are two spies in the city, and they're checking our defenses. Uh, we're going to have problems here. We have to find them. But Rahab, the prostitute, the harlot, she hides these two spies. And in exchange for that, she gets a promise. And the promise is when they come in and they take the city of Jericho, and what they're going to do, they're going to destroy every person in the city except for one family, Rahab and her family. Now, here's what happens with Rahab. She is saved in the middle of all this uh, battle of Jericho. And she and her family, they join in with these Israelites, become a part of this community of faith. And, and Rahab, she ends up marrying this guy, uh, Salmon, one of God's people. We, we don't know how that... I, I would love to hear the backstory on some of those kind of things. How did he connect up with the former prostitute... Uh, Rahab, how did they get together? But all we know is they got together, and Rahab becomes the great-great-grandmother of King David, which makes it a pretty big deal, especially considering where she'd come from. The next person, also in verse 5, is Ruth. Now, Ruth, like Tamar, like Rahab, she is a Gentile. This is the other weird part of this genealogy. We have Gentile women showing up in the genealogy of Jesus. She was from Moab. Now, Moab is one of the longstanding enemies of Israel. They, and the reason, when, when you follow all those stories of how God told these people to go in and destroy these cities, destroy these different people groups, it's because they were so sinful that, that they couldn't, they weren't ever going to turn to God. And God said, you have to wipe them out also because if you leave them there, you're going to start taking on their habits and you're going to start embracing their sinfulness and you need to get rid of all of them. The Moabites were a terrible, terrible people. And Ruth comes from those people. But along the way, there's this Israelite family that moves to Moab because of a famine and she ends up marrying an Israelite guy and then he dies. She's still young at the time and she, because of a wonderful, believing mother-in-law named Naomi, she, she starts embracing this Israelite religion, and she ends up going with her back to uh, God's people, engages with the covenant community of God's people, and through a series of things, she comes to marry a guy named Boaz, and Boaz is a wonderful, godly man, uh, people of the covenant, and they get married, 
And she becomes Ruth, this former Moabite, the great-grandmother of King David. An unlikely story. Now, I can't move on without mentioning another thing about Ruth. She has a book in the Bible named for her. Now, that's a big deal. It's a big deal. We have a couple of women with a Bible book named for them in an ancient world that did not value women. And again, it just tells you about the, the heart of God. And how did that happen? Jews were prohibited from intermarrying with people of Moab. Uh, the book of Ezra hits that hard, hard, hard. Should not, because they're pagan people, they're going to corrupt you. The only way that someone from Moab could be a part of God's people is to, is to renounce everything about the culture, the religion, everything about Moab. They're all their heritage from Moab. They had to renounce it all and embrace everything that it meant to be a part of the people of Israel, to be a people of the book, to be a people of faithfulness to the law of Moses. And so she's done this. And the fact that there is a book in the Bible named for a woman of Moab, it just shouts, God is a God of amazing, amazing grace. Then there's Bathsheba. You don't get her name in verse 6. You get her description. And David, the father of Solomon, by the wife of Uriah. And it's a big enough deal that the dad is David. But Matthew goes to great lengths to make sure that you connect the dots by the wife of Uriah, and that's Bathsheba. Now, most of you are going to be familiar with the story of David and Bathsheba, how David and Bathsheba committed adultery, and then to cover their sin of adultery when she became pregnant, they, they, they manufactured the murder of Uriah. Now, we're not sure what role she played. This is a, partly it is a hashtag me too kind of a situation in the scriptures. It's also, uh, it's also an evidence of, of her sinfulness and David's sinfulness. And what happens is there are going to be consequences for the two of them because of their sin. And there are going to be consequences for David as king for the rest of his life because of that event. But here's what else happens. Bathsheba becomes the father of the next king of Israel, Solomon. In spite of all that past, she's the mother of the king. The last person, that's why we want to read on down to verse 16, is Mary. Mary, the mother of Jesus. And she... She became pregnant before her wedding. The child's father was not her betrothed Joseph. An angel appeared to her and said, you're going to give birth. It's going to, even while a virgin, it's going to be a miracle. But that's a hard one to explain to the neighbors and the family. Because an angel didn't appear to them. And there would always be questions, always be suspicions. And yet, uh, coming through that story, Mary gives birth to the Son of God. So here are these five women. Uh, three are Gentiles. Three of the four were involved in sinful sexual relationships. One likely accused of it. Women did not figure prominently in these cultures, but are prominent in the Bible story. And here's what this teaches us. All five of these women share one thing in common, and that is in the course of their life, in the, the biggest thing they're known for, uh, often disgrace and shame and brokenness. And uh, failure, hurt, and what the Bible teaches us, because they appear in this genealogy, is God can use anyone to accomplish his purpose. And he's willing to forgive the worst of sins. And God is able to do the most unlikely things through the most unlikely of people. That people living in and by his plan for their own lives and for their world can do things that touch eternity. And will be remembered. Whatever real or perceived grace, shame, hurt, brokenness, failures, faults that you walked in with today. This is what I want you to hear. God's grace is greater still.
we all have our stuff, and for some of us today, the stuff that we're dealing with is stuff from our past, and it's messy, and it might have you stuck. The mess may be because of decisions that you made, or it, or it could be, it could have been through no fault of your own. Whatever the reason, some of us here today are trying to get past a messy past. Isaiah 43, 18 through 19 says, forget the former things, do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. You see, God is doing something new. And listen, listen to that language. I love the imagery. He's made a way through the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. God's future is greater than our past, but some of us, we can't see it. Some of us, we can't experience it. Some of us, we're desperate to find the way out of the wilderness. We're lost, or, or we're, we're dying of spiritual or emotional thirst. We, we need the stream that's in the wasteland. We're lost, but we just, we just don't know how to find our way out. We're stuck. And so in the time that we have left, I want to share with you five things that I think that can help us uh, move past our past and, and find the present and the future that God intended for you and for me. And these are, these are in your outline, and, and we'll go through these pretty quickly. And the first one is this. Your mess is part of your story, but it is not your identity. Your mess, it's a part of your story, but it's not your identity. Do you see the difference? You, uh, one says that it's a part of me. The other says this is me. When you let your past or your mistake or your struggle or your battle, when you let that define you, then what you're doing is you're putting all of your hope, all of your success, and all of your power in, in your ability to overcome it instead of giving it over to God. 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away, and the new, behold, the new has come. That the passage says that I'm not defined by my mess. I'm not defined by my past, by my struggle, by my failure, by my insecurity, by my fears or my hurts. That they, shape, they help shape me, but they don't define me. I'm a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. And, and some of you ask, what's the new? The new is Christ. Christ in me. Christ in me gives me definition. Christ in me gives me hope. Christ in me gives me perspective. Christ in me gives me strength. Christ in me gives me victory. Christ in me gives me value. You see, God uses the mess to create a masterpiece. Your past, your, your mess, it may be bad, but it doesn't mean that you are bad. That's a mistake that so many people make. They say, this was bad, so then I must be bad. But God says the exact opposite. God says, this was bad, but you're forgiven, or you're healed. You, you're restored. You are new. You are loved. You are my child. Your mess, it, it might be a chapter in your book, but it, it's, it's not the whole book. God is still writing your story. The second thing I want to tell you is we need to avoid the trap of wishing for a better past. We need to avoid the trap of wishing for a better, better past. And this is a surefire way to get stuck. It's like pulling up to a muddy field in your rear-wheel drive compact car, and you're going to try to drive right through that muddy field and get to the other side. But guess what? It's not going to work. You'll go for a few feet maybe, but your wheels will start spinning, and you'll start sinking, and you'll be stuck. And that's what wishing for a better past, that's what it will do for you. Wishing for a better past, it has absolutely no forward movement or no forward thinking at all. I'm, now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't learn from our past, but learning means looking back so that we can proceed forward, so we know how to go forward. Wishing for a better past is all about wanting to, to, uh, to go and do something that we have no power or ability to do. The only thing wishing for a better past will do is, uh, the only thing it will accomplish will be to give power to your, more power to your regrets or to your pain or shame, or your fear, your anxiety, your depression, or your low sense of worth. Philippians 3, 13 through 14 says, No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. 
Now, I, I know what you're, you're probably thinking here. Well, how can I forget my past? How can I block out a memory? How can I block out an experience that is so vivid in my mind? In fact, when I try to forget it, it, the exact opposite happens. It becomes prevalent. It's like if I told you right now, don't think of an elephant, the first thing you're going to do is what? You're going to think of an elephant. So what's Paul saying here? And I read one commentary, and I found this quote, and I think it helps us. It's, the word forgetting in this passage means no longer caring for, neglecting, refocusing, refusing, sorry, refusing to focus on that. Our memories, they store millions of pieces of information that we gain through our senses from the day that we're born. Even, even in the womb, we have, we have mem- we're making memories. And some experiences are impossible to forget, and any effort to forget them only makes them more prominent. You see, Paul's not advising us to, to do this memory, this memory wipe like we do a computer. We can't do that. He's telling us to focus on the present and the future rather than just the past. I read one blog that said, ultimately the only thing of the past that we should constantly dwell on is the cross. And the cross overcomes and it overwhelms any past mistakes or sins that we've committed. No longer do we have to be chained to our sin, but we're free to press forward and hang on to Jesus. We should be a people who are forward-focused. The past, yes, it's a part of you. It's a part of your story. But the whole idea of this point is is that we, we can't change that, so what do we do? We focus forward. We look ahead. We think about what could be and we need to well, what we need to do to get there. It's a process. And Paul says that he presses on. And the idea here is that, and he says that he's trying to win the race. It's, we're not talking about a nice, simple stroll through the park and just taking things easy. No, what Paul is talking about is this is, this is a full-on pursuit. And he's running as fast as, he's can, as he can and, and because he wants, he's chasing after the prize. He's not going to get stuck with, with the past, but what he wants to do is he's pressing on forward and he's going as hard as he can because he knows what's ahead of him is what God has for him. The next thing I want to tell you is that we need to address the mess. That's a phrase that, that I stole from, from Andy Stanley, but it's a great phrase. We need to address the mess. This means picking up the rug in our lives and looking at everything that we swept underneath. It means opening up the closet in our heart and taking out what we've tried to hide in there. And this is probably one of the scariest things that I'm going to say to you today, but we have to deal with our mess. We can spend a lot of time and energy trying to avoid things. And believe me, I, I, I'm, the, I'm, I'm like on the board of directors of the company of avoiding things. I, I know what that's like, and, 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 and I want to do that too. We don't want to address the mess because we know that it's going, it's going to take work, it's going to be hard, and, and it's probably going to hurt. It, it would just seem easier, but what we don't realize is the longer we let it go, the more damage that it's going to do. And it may not be immediate, but ignoring mess, it just it never goes well. Ignoring a hurt, it never makes it better. And here's another thing that we have to consider. How is is our mess affecting those around us? Am I the husband that I need to be when I'm minimizing my mess? Am I the wife that I should be when I act like nothing's wrong? Am Am I being the parent that God wants me to be when I'm not willing to face the difficulties that are happening? Am I being the the individual that God has desires for me when I choose to not give everything over to him? 2 Corinthians 12, 9 says, But he said to me, this is Paul talking, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. My grace is sufficient. Now, do you know what that means? It, it literally means this, that God's grace is enough. It's enough to help face and overcome whatever it is that's in front of you or behind you. Now, as, as human beings, we're, we're flawed and we're imperfect, and, and so we don't always buy into this. We don't always believe that, but God's Word tells us that His grace is enough. It was enough for Paul to deal with his thorn in the flesh that he describes. He doesn't ever tell us what it is, but it's something that he wanted to be delivered from. It was something that he wanted God to take away, but he never did. It was enough for him, and it's enough to help sustain you and, you and I while we address our mess. Can you make it? Can you do it? Well, with, with God's grace, yes. You see, part of the problem is, is we don't want to admit 
We don't want to admit that there's a problem. We don't want to admit that there's a mess. The first step in AA is, is we admitted we're powerless over alcohol, that our drinking had become unmanageable. And if you read on, it goes on to say, who cares to admit complete defeat? Practically no one, of course. Every natural instinct cries out against the idea of personal powerlessness. It is truly awful to admit, glass in hand, we have warped our minds into such an obsession for destructive drinking that only an act of providence can remove it from us. You see, the idea is I'm at a point in my life where I can't handle it anymore. I can't control this anymore. I can't do that. And that's the number one problem with people in our world. Not just people who struggle with alcohol, but all people. We live like we've got it. Like we've got this. We've got this under control. I can handle this. I can do this. This is not big enough. It's not a problem. I can take care of it. I'm, st I'm okay. We're all okay. Let's not worry about this. I've got it. But Paul says the opposite. He says, I don't have this. We don't got it. And that's okay. Paul says, I know the God who does. And when I'm, when I'm weak, he is strong. His power is perfect. I've just got to get out of his way. Part of addressing the mess is saying, I need, say, I need to deal with this and I need help. And God is waiting for the three words that will change your life. I surrender all. The fourth thing I want to share with you is that you don't want to fight alone. Don't fight alone. When it, comes to, when it comes to a mess, we try to avoid it, and we most certainly don't want to broadcast it. You know, I, we don't want to say, I've got a problem, or I can't handle this on my own. I've got a messed up past. I'm struggling. I'm not perfect. I don't have it all together. I'm afraid. I'm in over my head. No one's shouting that on the street corner, let alone saying it out loud in here. Why? Because we don't want to look bad. We've got an image to keep up. We're afraid that if people see our weakness, then they'll think, they'll think less of us. Maybe they won't respect us. Maybe they'll look at us differently, or maybe they'll judge us. They may not like us anymore, or worse yet, we're, we're afraid that they may not love us anymore. So we, uh, we isolate ourselves. Maybe not physically isolate, but we, we emotionally or spiritually or, or mentally isolate. But let me tell you something. Isolation when you do it that way, isolation is a, is a breeding ground for failure. Proverbs 18.1 says, Whoever isolates himself seeks his own desire. He breaks out against all sound judgment. Now this verse, is, is, it's talking about an antisocial behavior, but, but what I want you to catch is this last part. It says, He breaks out against all sound judgment. Now one of the dangers of isolation of pulling away, whether that's physically or, or emotionally, mentally, spiritually. One of the dangers of isolation is negative self-talk. When you start down the road of negative self-talk, here's what happens. There's no one there to argue with you or to set you straight. There's just you. And when you, when you, when you start with the negative self-talk, then the issues that you're facing, all of a sudden, they become bigger than they really are, and you lose perspective. Again, because you have no one to speak into your life and to keep those things in perspective. There's no one around you giving sound judgment. And one of the ways that we experience God's grace is through God's people. I know some of you are saying, no way, no way, Jimmy. I've been down that road before, and I got burned. I shared with someone, and it came back to bite me. Uh, you know, I'm out. And if that's your story, what I want to say is that uh, I'm sorry. That was not supposed to happen. You shared a hurt, you shared a need, a fear, an insecurity, and someone took advantage of that, or someone judged you, or gossiped about you, and that was wrong. And that's, I'm going to call it what it is, that's a sin. And for some of you, you were vulnerable, and it may have been in here to someone in this church. And I want you to know that not every believer, not every Christian is like that. You see, God gives us one another because we are better together. We're supposed to care for one another, to love one another, to support one another, to pray for one another, to help one another, and to stand in the gap for one another. One of the lies that we believe is, is that just I'm going to do this, I'm going to fight by myself. But there's freedom, there's freedom when we fight together. And here's what I mean by that. When the freedom is, is that you don't have to hide. You don't have to put on an act. You don't have to put on this mask. You don't have to put on this, this idea, look, look, I'm okay, I'm okay, I'm okay. Look, everything's fine, everything's good. You don't have, you know, I don't have problems. 
But there's freedom when you let someone else fight with you. Then you don't have to worry about putting on the show. You don't have to bear the load alone. You don't have to come up with all the answers. Not fighting alone means that you have people whom you trust, people whom you love that are speaking into your life. They're speaking wisdom. They're speaking hope. They're speaking encouragement. They're praying for you, and they're praying with you. We don't need to let pride or fear get in the way of allowing someone to come alongside you, to come alongside us as we address this mess. There are people that you know that love you who are waiting for you to come to them. The last one I want to share with you is that we just need to act differently. You've probably heard someone say this before, that feelings, feelings follow actions. And there's actually research out there that, that supports this statement. A lot of us are stuck because we're waiting to feel something different. I'll exercise when I feel like it. I'll work on the budget when I feel like it. I'll start this new habit when I feel like it. I'll change my patterns of behavior when I feel like it. Well, I'll deal with my kids or my marriage when I feel like it. I'll address that mess when I feel like it. Of course, we don't really always use that phrase, when I feel like it. Instead, a lot of us say, when I'm ready. I'll do that when I'm ready. But for most of us, the when I'm ready line, it's just merely a, it's just a stall tactic. It's another way to avoid what we don't want to deal with. And one of the best ways to start moving forward is to simply do something different. Because if you wait to feel different, then you're going to be stuck and you're just going to keep doing the same thing over and over. Romans 12, 2 says, Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. The process, this whole process of transformation, it, it, it takes time. Now, when we ask God to come into our lives and be our Lord and Savior, that's, that happens instantaneously. That's justification. We, that, our position has been from lost to found. But sanctification is that process where we're becoming more and more like Christ. And a part of transformation is doing something new, doing something different. Nothing different is going to happen until you start acting differently. If you don't normally deal with conflict, then you might have to do something different. If you've never confided in someone, you, you may have to do something different. If you've never apologized or, or owned your mistakes, then, then you may have to do something different. If you've never let someone keep you accountable, then you may have to do something different. And I could go on and, and on with examples, but the whole idea is nothing's going to change if your behavior stays the same. And one of the ways that we start to get past our past is when we start to do something different. Now, I, I'm in no way saying that if you do these five things, that, then, then all of your problems, all your past, your mess, your struggles, or your hurts, that they're, um, they're just magically going to go away. These are steps in, in a process, and they're part of a journey, but they're tangible things that you can put into practice, you can put into place right now to help you get past your past or your current struggle. 